Well, good evening everyone. Great to be here again this evening to uh, worship and to give honour to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to continue in 1 Samuel. Um, we're going to read first of all from 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verses 12 through 22. So 1 Samuel chapter 4 beginning to read at verse 12. The death of Eli. <coughs> then a man of Benjamin ran from the battle line the same day and came to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. Now when he came there was Eli sitting on a seat by the wayside watching for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he said, What does the sound of this tumult mean? And the man came quickly and told Eli. Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were so dim that he could not see. Then the man said to Eli, I am he who came from the battle, and I fled today from the battle line. And he said, What happened, my son? So the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has been a great slaughter among the people. Also your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. Then it happened, when he made mention of the ark of God, that Eli fell off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died. For the man was old and heavy, and he had judged Israel forty years. Now when his daughter-in-law, Phineas's wife, was with child, due to be delivered, and when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and gave birth, for her labour pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the woman, stood, the woman who stood by her said to her, Do not fear, for you have born a son. But she did not answer, nor did she regard it. Then she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God has been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. Amen. Okay. So we're continuing in the series in 1 Samuel that we've been looking at over the last few weeks. And we come to this, this passage in 1 Samuel chapter 4. And it's my job this week to look at Ichabod. The glory has departed. So this week we come to one of the sad events in, his, in Israel's history. We are here introduced to Ichabod, meaning the glory has departed. I was thinking as I was preparing this and thinking about looking at this name Ichabod and what it means, I was trying to think about have I heard anybody before speak on Ichabod? And I don't remember a sermon on Ichabod. I'm sure there has, but I can't remember one. But I remember a time when I was in a church, in a prayer meeting, and a man stood up and said, this is an Ichabod church. And as you can imagine, the whole church was silent. So tonight we are going to look at Ichabod. But before we look in more detail, let's just remind ourselves where we are from the past few weeks. It's not been a great time in Israel's history. We've heard how the word, of Lord, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. We've seen how the priests showed disregard to the people in their care and a disregard for God and his laws. We've seen how Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were wicked. The word says that they were wicked and they were not fulfilling their priestly duties. 
And Eli, their father, is doing nothing about it. Even though he's been warned through prophecies about the destruction that will come upon his household, about the destruction that will come upon Israel, Eli did nothing about his wayward sons, about those priests who showed no regard for Israel, for his people and for their God. Last week, Ryan brought to us how, and we looked at how Israel was defeated in battle. They went to battle against the Philistines. And we saw that moment where the Ark of God was captured. Captured, as Ryan said, as a result of their disregard for the Ark. Taking that Ark into the battle as though it was some good luck charm. They were not supposed to do that. But they took that ark into the battle, showing total disregard. And so God had allowed destruction to come upon Israel. So this week, as we come to this rather sad passage, which sees the death of Eli, and we see Phineas' wife in despair as she gives birth to a son and she calls him Ichabod. And as we read, meaning the glory has departed from Israel. This evening we're going to consider the following. The Ark of God and its importance for Israel. Why the glory had departed. What does Ichabod mean for us today? And then what should our response be? So first of all, the Ark of God and its importance to Israel. I, I thought it was important before we look at this Ichabod and what it meant for the people of Israel and what it means to us. We need to, to just consider for a few moments this Ark of God and why it was so important to Israel. Why it was that Eli was so uh, struck in horror that the uh, Ark had been captured and his daughter-in-law was so in despair that the Ark was gone. It was an important part of Israel's history. It was an important part of their life. So before we look at Ichabod, we need to look at this Ark of God. I think it's important for us to briefly look at the Ark of God and why it was so important. If we didn't look anywhere else in Scripture, we can tell its importance from 1 Samuel alone. As the whole of chapter 4 and some of beyond talks about the Ark of God, chapter 4 is pretty much dedicated to the Ark of God. In verse 13, Eli is waiting for the news of the battle. And we read these words, he says, There was Eli, sitting on a seat by the wayside, watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. This tells us the importance of the ark to the people of Israel. For Eli, although previously he shown disregard for the ark and disregard for the Lord, as he had honoured his sons over honouring the Lord, he now sits trembling as he knows and realises the importance of the ark of God to his people. We first see mention of the ark in Exodus 25 when God says to Moses in verse 8, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. The God of heaven and earth, all-knowing, all-wise, the omnipresent God, chooses for the sake of his people that an ark be constructed so that he would be amongst his people. The ark was a gracious act from God to his people, a God who is not confined to space or time and definitely not confined to a box. He makes his presence tangible to the people by instructing them to build this ark. And so this ark became so important as it was there that in the minds of the people that was where their God dwelled, that their God was amongst them. The ark of God rep uh, represented God's presence. This is what R.C. Sproul wrote about the ark. God is not bound by time, but he bound himself to the time-bound experience of his people. God is not bound by space, but he bound himself to this box. He is above all creational constraints, but he bound himself to them. 
He is everywhere, but he was there. This is why the ark was so important. Here is displayed what a wonderful God that he is. A God who chose to stoop very low and to humble himself for the sake of his wandering people in the wilderness. There in this ark, to the people, there was where God dwelt. It was the place of his presence which brought to them great assurance. This high, magnificent, majestic God dwelt among his grumbling, complaining and sinful people. No wonder then that Eli was trembling to know the whereabouts of the ark as he knew that it had been taken into battle. As we read about Eli's death and he hears about the shocking events of what's happened in the battle, we see that it wasn't so much the shock of hearing about his son's death that toppled him off his chair to his death. No, it was the horror of this tragic event that this ark, so precious to the people of Israel, where their very God dwelt, had gone, captured. It was more a sorrowful, a sad event that day. And it was this event that caused despair to Phineas's wife, who declared her son's name to be Ichabod, for the ark had gone, the glory had departed from Israel. It was almost as if God himself had gone. So we briefly looked at the importance of the ark to the people of Israel. Now we have to ask ourselves, why has the glory departed? Of course we, we understand the physical reasons that the glory departed, how they felt that the glory departed, as declared by Phineas' wife, that the ark had gone. It was captured by the Philistines. It was out of their grasp, this very place where they saw was their comfort, their assurance. The place where God dwelt was now in the hands of the air enemies, the Philistines. However, it is much more than a physical box being missing. The reason lies in all that has gone before us, all that we've been looking at over these past few weeks as we've been going through 1 Samuel and various preachers have been here standing and sharing through Samuel. The reason lies in all that we've seen before. It's interesting to know what Phineas's wife says in verse 21. He says that she named the child Ichabod, saying that the glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God had been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband. It's important to know here that she lies the blame at the feet of her father-in-law and her husband Phineas. For she says it's because of them that the ark has been captured. So it's a much deeper despair than the fact of the physical ark being captured. It was how it had got to that state, how it had got to the point where Israel had allowed the ark of God to be captured. How had they got there? How they allowed themselves to be in this place? How had Israel managed to lose the ark, the presence of God, to the Philistines? Phineas' wife knew that it wasn't just down to the battle that we looked at last week that Ryan shared with us. It was because of the disregard shown by her father-in-law and, and, and his sons, Hophni and Phinehas. This battle culminated in God allowing his judgment on Israel, just as Eli had been warned. From the start of 1 Samuel, we've seen the growing picture of the disregard for not only of God's people, but for God himself. The priests themselves, Eli, sons Hophni and Phinehas, they had no regard for the Lord and no regard for his laws at all. In chapter 2, we saw how they were described as wicked and did not know the Lord. They took of the offering before they were supposed to, not waiting for the meat to be roasted as commanded by the law. They served themselves only and had no regard for the people and no regard for the Lord. We see too how Eli disregards the Lord by honouring his sons over the Lord. Eli is warned more than once in prophecy about his wicked sons. 
but he does nothing about it. Then, as we saw last week, comes the battle. Here we see a total disregard by the sons of Eli and the people of Israel. Disregard for the Lord and for the ark. As they take the ark of God into that battle as though it was some kind of good luck charm. That it would give them some kind of guarantee that they would, that would give them victory in that battle. Also let us remember that the two tablets of stone containing the Ten Commandments, they were in the ark, God's law, God's words to his people. They were all massively important to the people of Israel and their disregard to this was an abomination. John MacArthur says this, the ark symbolised the presence and power of the Lord. Yet Israel treated it like a good luck charm, which would ensure victory over the Philistines. They confused the symbol of his presence with his actual presence, showing that their understanding of God was no different to that of the Philistines. Such a powerful statement that the people of God, those who cherished this ark of God, who saw the ark of God as his presence at this time their understanding of God's presence was no different to that of the Philistines who wanted the ark themselves as a good luck charm so we see that the glory of God as Phineas's wife put it it didn't depart overnight it wasn't something that just vanished it wasn't sudden and it wasn't unexpected it came after periods of continued disobedience and disregard for the Lord, for his word, for his law, and for his people. And as already mentioned earlier, God warned them about this coming destruction, but they still did nothing. Israel, as a nation, had abandoned itself. They had traded and reduced their God to a good luck charm, and their disregard and obedience, disobedience had caused the judgment of God to fall on them. And for the wife of Phineas to, to declare, the glory has departed from Israel. What a sad day that we see here. What a sad story that we read. We can almost feel the despair in the words of the wife of Phineas as she declares the name of her son, Ichabod, and say the glory has departed from Israel. The sadness and the hopelessness of a God who had seemingly departed. I'm sure if we're all switched on today, to all what we've heard so far this evening, to all what we've read throughout this book of Samuel. If we're switched on, we can see what's happening all around us today. It doesn't take a genius to work out and how this all makes sense for us today. And so we ask this question now, what does Ichabod mean for us today? This name Ichabod, it was given to a boy thousands of years ago, a name which meant the glory has departed. The events of Israel that led to the, this woman declaring over this nation that the glory has departed. How does that fit in to our lives today in 2024? As I said, if we're pretty much switched on as Christians, if today here we're born again Christians and we're switched on to today's society, I'm sure we all know what Ichabod means today. I want us to firstly, as we consider this question, what does Ichabod mean for us today? I want us to firstly consider our nation, Great Britain. As we look back over the centuries of this great nation, we really do have such a great, rich Christian heritage. And God has really blessed this nation over the centuries, rising up men of God to work for him. Those who have translated the Bible, evangelists, pastors, missionaries, 
We can think of men like Tyndale, Wycliffe, Bunyan, John Newton, Wilberforce, Spurgeon, Wesley, Whitfield, and the list goes on and on, and many more great men that this nation has seen who God rose up. We were considered a Christian country. Of course, there's always been unbelievers, there's always been those who had, had disregard for the law, but generally, in centuries gone by, Christianity in this country and churches have led from the front, practicing and instilling into the nation a sense of Christian morality and respect. Christianity was largely responsible for our laws, our schools. It was Christianity that set up largely many charities in this country, orphanages and the like. It was Great Britain who sent out missionaries to far-flung places in the world, taking the gospel to Africa, to Asia, and so forth. Christianity was seen and was alive in this nation over the centuries. The glory of God was seen in Great Britain. But what about now? What about today in 2024? Surveys show that we are as far away from being a Christian country than we have ever been. For the first time in over a thousand years, we are no longer regarded as a Christian country, as a Christian nation. Surveys show that most people in our nation have no Christian belief at all, do not attend to church and do not describe themselves as a Christian. Not only does the nation not hold to Christian beliefs and values and morals, but there's a blatant disregard for Christ and the church. There's a blatant disrespect and hatred for Christianity, for the word and for Christ. And anyone who is involved in open air work sees this every time that we go out. A complete disregard, a, com a complete disinterest, a hatred for the word of God, a hatred for Christ. A nation once blessed by the glory of God, built on Christianity, now largely turns its back on Christ and actively goes against the things of Christ. A nation that once sent out missionaries, now has missionaries coming to us from Africa and from Asia and so forth. A nation that once was built on Christian foundations and Christian morality is now a nation of confusion, apathy and perversion. It is safe to say, as a nation, as Great Britain, we are Ichabod. The glory has departed. But how so? How does a nation once built on Christianity become so against it? have such a hatred for the Christ in which we serve. How, we, how have we arrived here? As with the nation of Israel that we looked at, it hasn't happened overnight. Somehow we have found that this great nation of Great Britain lies desolate. Phineas's wife didn't just declare that the ark was captured, she laid the blame at Eli and Phineas's feet. It was because of them. How so today? Wherein lies the blame for the state of our nation? If we look back over the centuries, it was the church that was at the forefront, actively involved in the life of Great Britain. The church preached the gospel. The church believed the gospel. The church sought to live out the gospel, honouring the Lord and his word. Over the course of time, that has declined to such an extent to where we are left with the church today. The visible church, the church that the nation sees as church, the church that the nation sees as Christianity, is so far removed from the days of the great men of God mentioned earlier, and so far removed from the glory that this nation once seen, that it's depart this nation has departed. Because the, because the glory has departed from the visible church. The visible church is now largely Ichabod. As we have seen over the past few weeks, the disregard and disobedience that the priests of Israel showed towards the Lord and for the ark is very much resembled in the church of our time. 
And like Israel, it has happened over time. We have the church like Israel. The church has traded and reduced Christ and the word to a good luck charm. A name to be used when sick, when finances are low, when they need whatever they need, to speak the name of Christ over it and all will be well. We see a church that has no regard or respect for the word, for Christ or doctrine. A church that wants easy believism and regards those who honour and have a regard for these things as fanatics, as over the top. Worse still, we have a church that no longer stands out and sets an example to the world, but a church that supports, encourages and promotes the worldly perverseness in the name of inclusivity, political correctness and modernism. And to appeal to the whims of the day, they have chucked out Christ and his word and a disregard for the gospel and for the work and person of Christ. This, friends, is Ichabod. The glory has departed. Not only has it departed, but as with Israel, it is an abomination. I've mentioned this before in past when I've preached, and I've used this following allegory when describing the church of our time, and I make no apology for using it again here, if you've heard this before. When I was at school, I read a book called Animal Farm by George Orwell. Some of you may have read it. And in that story, we see how the animals, the farm animals, were getting so fed up of the humans who were making the decisions, bad decisions. And they were getting fed up with them, and they decided it was time for something better. They had a revolt, and they ran the farmers off the land. They would run things, the animals would run things. The farmhouse would be out of bounds, and that represented humanity and all that was bad about humans, wrong and greedy. These animals set about forming a new way of life, where everyone would be equal, and no one would be more important than the other. They set an example to the other farms. The other farms saw the unity this farm had. However, as time went on, some of the pigs changed that. They wanted control. They wanted to be in charge. And they changed things. And they started to become greedy again. They started to become like humans. And they were so much against that they were so much against. Slowly, they set themselves up as the leaders. And they move into the farmhouse. Some neighbouring farmers want to do business with the pigs. They have a meeting in the farmhouse. And in the final scene of the book, in the final lines, it says something like this. That the other animals peer through the, door, through the window and they look from man to pig and from pig to man and they are unable to tell them apart. In this day, as we look from church to the world and from the world to the church, Sadly, we cannot tell them apart. And so we move to our final question. What should our response be? I'm sure like myself, if you're a member here at Watchorn, that we're very privileged to be members here, part of this family of God here in Watchorn. A church led by leaders who are keen to ensure that the word, that the gospel remains of central importance. A church that preaches truth. A church that protects the pulpit and doesn't bow down to the whims of the day. I'm sure, like me, you're truly blessed to be in such a fellowship. And so our first response to this should be that we give thanks to the Lord for his blessing and his provision for us as a people. That we should give thanks to our pastor and our leadership. But friends, we should also not be complacent. As the saying goes, there go I, but for the grace of God. We should all ensure that we are in his word, praying and seeking the Lord's protection over us, that we don't move to the right or to the left, but but that we stay focused and keep our eyes fixed on the Lord, on his truth, on his word, on his gospel. And also our response should be like that of Phineas' wife. 
She was in anguish and grief over the ark of God and that the glory had departed from Israel. In those days, children were not given names like Ichabod because it was fashionable, because everybody, because all the women down the road were calling the kids Ichabod. No, names were given because they meant something. In this case, the glory had departed, and that name would stay with that child, with that man, as he grew up all the days of his life, the glory had departed. It was a reminder of his mother's anguish and grief. Are we in anguish and grief over the state of our nation? And more so, are we in grief and anguish over the state of the so-called church? Does it grieve us that the church has wandered so far from the truth that it is almost impossible to tell them apart from the world? Does it grieve us that our nation no longer has any regard for Christ but is lost, confused and even worse has become so perverse? Does it grieve us what the world is trying to teach our children? It should do. And if not, we need to run to the Lord and ask him to help us. Our response should be that it should cause us to be on our knees in prayer and cry out to the Lord that the nation might be saved, that the church would repent and be saved, and that we would see the glory again in our churches and in our nation. To sum up, I'm going to use a quote which I was a little bit, a quote from the scripture, I was a bit hesitant to use it as it's a quote that over time has been quite misquoted. But I believe it does sum up what our response should be. 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. The only way our nation will be healed is if we pray. Is if we humble ourselves and pray for our nation. Pray for the church that it will turn from its wicked ways. That it will turn in repentance. That we would see the church revived. Declaring once again the true gospel of Christ. Standing once again on the truth of scripture. Declaring that salvation belongs to God. That he is full of grace and mercy. And then, by God's mercy, we will start to see a church and a nation healed. So we've looked briefly tonight at this very sad passage, this very sad time in Israel's history. And we find ourselves as a nation, as a church, in very similar times, very, very sad days. And so to end, after all, our simple response is this. If we are born again of Christ, if we are concerned about the nation, if we're concerned about the so-called visible church, our simple response is this as I finish, is to humble ourselves and to pray. Amen.